Thank you all for coming. Um, first question, can the people at the back hear me? Yes. That is wonderful. Uh, special thanks to the Ceasefire Now Roaring Fork Valley Coalition for the invitation. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, I deeply appreciate your time and your interest in this topic. To say at the outset, I really wish we were meeting under different circumstances. Uh, the topic for tonight's lecture is very much about the ethics of global responsibility, and I hope I can live up to the moral gravity of this topic um, that is really now at the top of the global agenda. Uh, obviously, this topic matters for Israelis and Palestinians, for the greater Middle East, for relations between the West and the Arab Islamic world, for relations between the global North and the global South, and this topic also especially matters for Americans, for American foreign policy. I view events of October the 7th and their aftermath as on the same level, internationally, globally, morally, as 9-11. I think this is a watershed moment. It's a transformative moment. It's a morally clarifying moment. And in many ways, I don't think there's any going back to our world pre-October the 6th. I think historians are going to write and analyze this particular topic, this particular date, and talk about how, in many ways, things changed. One of the things that's at stake here is very much the international human rights architecture has been severely strained by recent events in the Middle East. And it's an open question as to whether it can recover from the calamity unfolding before our eyes. I'm also very worried about how this conflict is going to end. It's very unclear to me because we're still in the middle of it. What the off-ramp is, what the way out is, all of the possible scenarios, as someone who's been studying this topic for most of my life, all of the um, scenarios that keep me awake at night um, uh, make me lose more sleep because um, as bad as things are, I'm very much aware that they can become much worse in the coming months um, as we watch this tragedy unfold. In the context of the United States, I've been telling my students that this particular topic, this crisis in Gaza, the situation in Israel, has historic parallels that are on par with the Vietnam War, and secondly, the 2003 American invasion and occupation of Iraq. Sadly, when I reference the Vietnam War to my students at Georgetown, they don't really know what I'm talking about. But looking around the room, I see there's some people that do have a memory of that topic. And I encourage my students really to study the Vietnam War. If they don't have time to study or read about it, I strongly encourage them to, to watch this wonderful 10-part uh, documentary that was put together a few years ago by Ken Burns about the Vietnam War, which really talks about how your, this moment reminds me of that particular time period. So everyone, I think, who has a conscience, who has a moral compass, who claims to have a basic sense of ethics, I think must pay close attention to what is happening in Israel-Palestine today, especially in the Gaza Strip. And then there's the question of U.S. moral responsibility. What's happening in Gaza, I think, is particularly important if you are an American voter, an American taxpayer, an American citizen, given the seismic and consequential role that the United States has been playing in this unfolding drama in the Middle East. I think there's a unique uh, American responsibility because a shift in the right direction in American policy, I think, might lead to a better outcome, both in the short term and the long term. So this is day 160 of the Israel-Gaza War. And this is what we know so far. Uh, 1,200 Israelis were killed on October the 7th, most of them civilians. Over 200 were taken hostage, and at least 100 of them are reported to still be alive under Hamas control somewhere in Gaza. Israeli society and supporters of Israel have been deeply and understandably traumatized by the atrocities and war crimes that Hamas inflicted on Israel on October the 7th. The Palestinian side, here's what we know. During the first 100 days of this war, Israel dropped the kiloton equivalent of three nuclear bombs on the Gaza Strip, one of the most densely populated areas on Earth, where 2.2 million people have been living in horrible conditions. And I'm talking about before October the 7th. Um, right now, right now, the um, um, number of people that have been killed, according to reliable estimates, is 32,000 people killed, 
um, 1.8 million people displaced, 70% 70, 70 of the homes in Gaza are either destroyed or damaged. Most of Gaza's cultural heritage has been um, um, eradicated, destroyed, either partly or in total. 500,000 people, according to human rights groups today, as we speak, as we meet, are on the brink of starvation, and the International Criminal Court has ruled that what's happening in Gaza um, um, constitutes a plausible case of genocide. Recently, there's a new John Hopkins University study that reported that an escalation of the war in Gaza on its current sort of trajectory could lead to the deaths of 85,000 more Palestinians from injury and disease over the next six months. These fatalities are on top of the 32,000 people that have already been killed. And if this were to occur, that would mean that 6% of Gaza's population would have been killed, one of the highest rates of death since the Rwanda genocide, according to Andrew Gilmore, a former senior UN human rights official. So now my PowerPoint has suddenly failed me, but let's see if I can get it back. So this is the agenda for um, tonight. I want to answer the broad question, what is the appropriate historical, moral, and political context to understand events in Israel-Palestine? As you all know or should know, this crisis didn't begin on October the 7th, but I want to look at history, I want to look at politics, and I want to look at ethics and provide a moral framework that can help you better understand what's going on. I also want to deal with some, with some myths and realities um, that have distorted, I think, an objective understanding of this topic as reported in the mainstream analysis of this crisis. My approach is a human rights-centered approach. It's a social justice approach. It's not a tribal approach. It's not even an American approach. I don't take my um, moral guidelines in terms of understanding world politics based on what the White House happens to be saying at a particular um, uh, moment in time. I take international law very seriously. I pay close attention to what credible human rights groups like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International say about a particular topic. I pay special close attention to what local credible human rights groups have to say about a particular crisis. In this case, it's the credible Israeli human rights organization Beth Salem, the Palestinian human rights group Al Haq. And I have a firm belief in equality, equal treatment, and that means in the context of Israel-Palestine that both groups of people that are in conflict today are entitled, entitled to the same human, political, and national rights. And I take strong umbrage against people who try to say that no, one group of people, because of their ethnicity or religion, are entitled to greater rights than the other group. And so that basically means if you... Um, Think about this, it means that at the end of the day, Palestinians will never be secure unless Israelis are secure, and Israelis will never be secure until Palestinians are also secure. Another preliminary interpretive point uh, that I want to share with you, that when it comes to making moral judgments about any political conflict, a binary, black and white approach can sometimes be misleading and distorting. I often tell my students, Two things can be correct at the same time simultaneously. For example, the Hamas attack on October the 7th was a moral obscenity that must be condemned, period, full stop. And by the same moral logic, Israel's brutal assault on the Gaza Strip, now into its six months, six months, must also be condemned, period, full stop. The task that lies before us tonight is how to connect the political dots, how to connect the various moral data points into a coherent, morally consistent, and intellectually honest framework of analysis. That's the task that I see that lies before me. So um, let me just get to the next slide um, that deals with moral frameworks. So a relevant question. What is the best, the most appropriate moral framework that we should adopt? understand this crisis. We've been exposed in this country and around the world already to several moral frameworks. I want to briefly summarize them. One moral framework is that this conflict is fundamentally and comprehensively about anti-Semitism. October the 7th was the biggest killing of Jews in a single day since the Holocaust, which is actually true. This is the official U.S. and Israeli position. Much of the Western world takes that position. 
Um, part of this moral framework is that Hamas was created for the sole purpose of killing Jews. Nothing more to know about that topic. This is another moment similar to the 1930s in Europe. We need to sort of be aware of the dangers that lie around the corner. Uh, Hamas is ISIS. If only it would disappear, there would be peace in the Middle East. That's framework number one. The second framework that is sort of very much built into the mainstream American foreign policy discourse, the analysis in Washington, D.C., is that um, we have to look at this conflict through the prism of American foreign policy and national security. The U.S. has friends and enemies. It doesn't matter about the character of those regimes. We should be supporting our friends and allies because they are on our side in the global conflict. It's not about really ethics. It's about friends. It's about our political, strategic, and economic interests. This is what you call in the international relations literature uh, the realpolitik, or realist school of thought. It shapes a lot of the U.S. debate on this topic and on other topics globally. Israel is a close Middle East ally and friend. They help advance our interests in the region and beyond. We must stand by them during this difficult time. We need to hug them closely because they are our close friends. Sometimes you'll see variations of this coming out of the president's office where he once said that if Israel didn't exist, we would have to create it because it's a stable aircraft carrier in a troubled part of the world, and we need to stand by it. So that's, the, that's framework number two. The third framework, yeah, you hear sort of sometimes when Donald Trump opens his mouth, and that's called the ancient ethnic and religious hatreds framework. And if you listen closely to what Trump and some people in the GOP say, it goes like this. These people have been fighting for thousands of years. There's nothing done to reconcile them, it's very much in their DNA, both sides are beyond redemption, we just got to try and manage this as easy as we can. This is what I call the intellectual, lazy and historically ignorant framework of understanding global conflict. But it frequently reappears itself. I remember when a similar moral crisis was facing the world in the United States in the 1990s, that's exactly what former President Bill Clinton said about Bosnia. They've been fighting for 500 years, he even said sometimes a thousand years. What can we do to stop it? Um, that's always, often a convenient position to adopt when you don't want to live up to your moral responsibilities. Uh, and then finally, there's a framework that I think many scholars, academics, and some political activists adopt, and that's the framework of settler colonialism. Israel is a settler colonial state that is treating Palestinians in similar ways that Americans and Canadians and Europeans have treated indigenous populations over the course of history during the heyday of their colonial and imperial rule. Just look at what's happening in the West Bank. It looks very much like a particular settler colonial occupation. I think historically speaking, I use this framework of analysis of settler colonialism. Um, while it's not comprehensive in scope and it has some shortcomings as a good initial entry point to objectively understand the roots of this crisis and why this topic resonates so deeply throughout the global south. It's not a coincidence that South Africa took the lead in filing a case against Israel for the crime of genocide. Um, and it's not a coincidence also, if you look at the votes at the UN, it's very much the global south on one side of the equation, the United States and sometimes some European countries on the other side of this particular debate. And I'm sympathetic to this framework of um, uh, settler colonialism, because as a student of history, if you read the relevant primary documentation on this conflict, the founding fathers of Jewish nationalism, known as Zionism, both on the left-wing spectrum of Zionism and the right-wing spectrum of Zionism, were very open and honest that what they were planning, what their project was, was very much in keeping with what other European powers had done in the past. It was a colonial settler project. So yes, it's true, there always was a small Jewish population in historic Palestine that existed there, and they were indigenous to the land. But that small Jewish population did not have nationalist aspirations, like um, the European Zionists who founded the concept of Zionism were to, were to adopt later on through the 20th and into the 21st century. The vast majority of inhabitants of historic Palestine what we call Israel-Palestine today, were overwhelmingly Arab, mostly Muslim, and some Christian. They form the majority going back hundreds of years, perhaps a thousand years. And from day one, they were very wary when they started to hear this idea of a new project of creating a Jewish home in their backyard. They were very wary 
of being dispossessed and displaced. And so if you read the text of um, political Zionism, uh, the founding father, if you know your history, is Theodore Herzl. And as early as 1895, Theodore Herzl, the prophet and founder of modern Zionism, wrote in his diary in anticipation of an establishment of a future Jewish state somewhere in the Middle East. Um, he said, quote, we shall try to spirit the penny penniless Arab population across the border by procuring employment for it in the transit countries while denying it employment in our country. The removal of the poor must be carried out discreetly and circumspect circumspectly. There's a story that when Herzl wrote his book on the Jewish state roughly around the same time, that the rabbis of Vienna sent a delegation to then Palestine uh, to check out what was going on there and what, what, what was happening in this part of the world and whether there was any prospect for creating a Jewish state there. When the rabbis came back, they famously said that the bride is beautiful, but she is already married to another man. Mm -hmm. Meaning, someone else lives there, um, and we got a problem. On the right wing of the political spectrum in Zionism, if you know your history, um, the figure of Ze'ev or Vladimir Jabotinsky, who is the intellectual sort of guru or forefather of Benjamin Netanyahu, right wing sort of um, version of Zionism, an intellectual um, sort of uh, theorist of Zionism that, that you can trace his ideas right to Netanyahu and his right wing coalition. In a very famous essay called The Iron Wall in 1923, uh, Jabotinsky wrote the following quote. Every native population in the world resists colonists as long as it has the slightest hope of being able to rid itself of the danger of being colonized. That is what the Arabs in Palestine are doing, and that they will persist in doing as long as there remains a solitary spark of hope that they will be able to prevent the transformation of Palestine into the land of Israel. On the left wing of the political spectrum, David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first Prime Minister, um, wrote um, in the 1930s the following words, quote, Let us not ignore the truth among ourselves. Politically, we are the aggressors and they defend themselves. The country is theirs because they inhabit it. Whereas we want to come here and settle down. And in their view, we want to take away from them their country. And you can go through all of the figures of um, Zionism, the Founding Fathers, and you'll see similar statements that have been sort of articulated uh, time and time again. One of the leading scholars of uh, the history of the Israel-Palestine conflict is Benny Morris, a very good scholar, quite a bit of an odious political person, but um, in one of his books he wrote, I think quite accurately, the following words about the nature of the Israel-Palestine conflict and the question of Jewish nationalism and Zionism, where he said, quote, transfer was inevitable and inbuilt into Zionism because it sought to transform a land which was Arab into Jewish and create a Jewish state, and this could not have arisen without a major displacement of the Arab population, end quote. So I think the big historical point here is when you look at the founding documents and history of this conflict, is that the tale of Palestine from the beginning until today is really a story of colonialism and dispossession, yet the world treats it as some sort of multifaceted, complex story, hard to understand or even solve. Indeed, the story of Palestine has been told before. European settlers coming to a foreign land, settling there, and either committing genocide against or expelling an indigenous population. The Zionists who came to the Middle East have not really invented anything new in this respect. The difference, though, is that when the West was colonizing and settling North America, Australia, and other parts of the world, they were doing so in the 17th century, the 18th century, the 19th century. When you get to the 20th century, this starts to recede. The case of Israel is different is because it's happening in the 20th century, post-World War II, and in many ways right up till today, if you're following what's happening in the West Bank. And so, the problem here is that international morality on these questions have shifted, and, and, and many people are not willing to tolerate this type of behavior in a different global atmosphere. And also it should be pointed out that from the very beginning of this conflict, the great powers, 
were very supportive of Zionism, not because they really loved Jews or had deep sympathy to the Jewish people, but because they viewed Israel as a potential sort of ally where they could project their power uh, in the region. My bad. Okay, um, where they could project their power and have influence. And this is very clear, again, if you read the primary documents um, um, over, the, over the early history of this particular problem. Um, um, Arthur Balfour, who was the British Foreign Secretary and wrote the famous Balfour Declaration, in talking to his fellow cabinet ministers in 1922, said about the question of Zionism and the question of the Palestinians, he wrote the following words, quote, Zionism, be it right or wrong, good or bad, is of far profounder import than the desires and prejudices of the 700,000 Arabs who now inhabit that ancient land." End quote. And after World War II, when the United States replaced Britain as the major external power, it basically continued this particular policy, viewing Israel as um, an ally of Western interests in the region. Of course, many things had changed after World War II, and there's many other reasons why the West has historically supported Israel. Primarily, the um, I don't know why that keeps popping up. Primarily because of the uh, the history of uh, anti-Semitism and the rise of the Nazi Holocaust. So let me just show you a brief six-minute video that I show to my students every year when it comes to when it comes to um, trying to give them a basic introduction to the background of this conflict. to the sound. <clears throat> there it is. And what you can do to help achieve that again. What would happen if you build a refuge for a persecuted people in a place where another people already lived? In the next few minutes you'll learn why this moral quandary is at the root of the struggle between Israelis and Palestinians. And what you can do to help achieve a just peace for everyone in the region. First, there are a couple of things it's helpful to understand. One, many Jews fled harsh persecution in anti-Semitic Europe, especially the Nazi Holocaust. Zionists encouraged massive emigration to historic Palestine, at that time a British colony, where Jews had an age-old connection and where small Jewish communities had long existed among larger groups of indigenous peoples. But when the UN offered the Jewish immigrants the majority of the land for a new state called Israel. For the indigenous Palestinians who lived there, it was a massive destruction of life. They rejected the UN's partition plan, and several Arab states invaded the new state of Israel. Israeli forces essentially erased over 400 Palestinian villages and towns. By the end of the fighting, Israel controlled 78% of historic Palestine. And when three quarters of a million Palestinians who fled or were expelled during fighting tried to return to their homes where the new state now stood, they were permanently barred by the Israeli government. While over 100,000 of their relatives and neighbors who hadn't left became second-class citizens of the new state, along with the new Jewish majority. Today, Palestinian refugees and their descendants number in the millions. Most are in the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, and Jordan. Many are spread throughout the world, with millions still living in refugee camps, seeking to return to their homeland. To sum up, one group of refugees found a much needed home, but in the process, a new group of refugees was created. Here's the second thing to understand. Israel was founded as a Jewish state, but now ask yourself, what exactly does that mean? People had lots of ideas about what a Jewish state should look like. Some called for equality for all citizens. But what was created in practice was institutional discrimination against non-Jews. In other words, Israel ended up being built on a blueprint of exclusion. The Israeli government wants the maximum land and resources for Jews, but not the Palestinians living there. That's why Inside Israel, Jews get special privileges, including rights to land and housing, that are denied to the Palestinian citizens, who make up 20% of Israel's population. <laughs> 
That's also part of why Israel has never defined its borders. In fact, they still hold on to land, the West Bank and Gaza, that they conquered in the war in 1967. Since then, Israel has built Jewish settlements throughout the occupied West Bank, building Jewish-only cities and supplying them with infrastructure like roads and army camps, schools, and even a college. Military occupations are meant to be temporary, but after 40 plus years, this one looks permanent and entirely unjust. In the West Bank, Israeli Jewish settlers and Palestinians live on the same land, but must live under two completely separate and unequal systems of Israeli law. The Jewish settlers dominate the natural resources, including water and agricultural land, and they're backed by the Israeli army. To maintain the occupation, Israel has demolished thousands of Palestinian homes and orchards, confiscated Palestinian land, bombed a captive civilian population in Gaza, and punished resistance with raids, arrests, and assassinations, all to gain maximum land while making life so difficult for Palestinians that they will either leave or be too afraid to resist. Palestinians have fought back. For decades, they tried to achieve national liberation through armed struggle. Some groups still do. But the majority now support the popular protest instead. The deeply harmful pattern of control, repression, and violence profoundly harms Palestinians living under occupation and Israelis living as occupiers. This must be broken to reach a peaceful and secure future for both peoples. Now that you understand the problem, what about the solution? What about peace talks? So far, over two decades of U.S.-backed peace talks have actually made things worse by helping Israel continue the occupation. It's been years of talking while Israel massively expanded the Jewish settlements and literally redrew the map. Peace talks are good if they're real, but not when they're theater to cover a land grab. So now what? The current world superpower, the United States, has been a terrible friend enabling Israel's destructive and self-destructive expansion onto Palestinian land by funding the Israeli military, the biggest recipient of U.S. foreign aid in the world. But there's another superpower that can make the difference. You. There's a movement with hundreds of thousands of people just like you across the world, including Palestinians and Israelis, protesting, educating, divesting, and boycotting, all to bring nonviolent international pressure on Israel to stop violating human rights of Palestinians. Throughout history, where governments have failed to push for justice, people just like you, like us, have taken the lead and won. Now it's the Palestinians' turn for freedom and justice. We can pressure Israel to end the occupation and the discrimination. We want all people, Jews and Palestinians, to have equality, human rights, and democracy. We can change history. Join us. Um, I want to, in the remaining remarks, uh, any time that I have, provide some critical background uh, that was not discussed in that little video um, that gets us to where we are today in Gaza. Uh, that video was created roughly in 2011, 2012. What they didn't talk about, I think in significant ways, was particularly this period of time. What happened in these critical years from 2005 until today? And 2005 is a critical year because that was the year when Israel decided to pull out uh, or withdraw, and I say withdraw in quotes because it wasn't a full withdrawal. Israel had about 7,000 settlers there. It was the occupying authority over Gaza, and it decided to pull out because it was just too costly, too painful. Israel's international reputation was taking a beating over what was being done in Gaza. So Israel pulls out of the Gaza Strip, but not entirely. What it effectively does more accurately, it redeploys its troops to the perimeter of the Gaza Strip, controlling all entry points, all air corridors, the sea, the one part of Israel that it doesn't control is the Egyptian border, and it closely coordinates um, with Egypt who goes in and who goes out. Um, roughly since 2005, the Gaza Strip has been under a form of a blockade. You can't get in, you can't get out, unless Israel gives its permission. Um, 
Around this time, uh, in fact, a year later, they had elections in the Gaza Strip. And to everyone's surprise, Hamas won those elections. And they won the elections because they were campaigning on a platform of anti-corruption. The ruling establishment, the PLO, Fatah, was so monumentally corrupt, people wanted to change. Uh, not that different than what happened in this country in 2016 when people wanted to change after um, more of the same was presented to them as an option. And so in 2006, Hamas gets elected. They effectively become the governing authority. And because they are a militant group that has engaged in acts of terrorism, but view themselves as a national resistance organization, they started to fire rockets into Israel, uh, protesting the siege, protesting the loss of um, their family and their homes and their sort of situation in Israel would retaliate. Um, and you had a series of wars, roughly, during this period between 2008 and uh, 2021, if you will, um, where basically it's the same scenario. You have um, rocket fire coming out of the Gaza Strip into Israel, and then Israel responding with um, a lot of firepower, because it's a much more stronger military, into the Gaza Strip. And the big wars that you have during this time period are in 2008, in 2012, 2014, and then 2021. Um, and it's basically the same scenario. So if you look at the next slide, I have sort of a, um, a visual here that gives you a sense of the death toll that happened <coughs> during this time period. And you can see the Palestinian casualties are always much larger than the Israeli casualties. So in 2008, it was about 1,400 Palestinians that were killed, about 10 to 11 Israelis, and so on. And that pattern of behavior continues throughout these various wars. There's one slide that I have that summarizes this situation. <coughs> and it's this one. This gives you a sense of the number of people that were killed during this time period in all of these wars. Roughly um, 6,417 Palestinians killed, 310 Israelis from 2000 and, um, from the 2005, if you want, or 2008, when the first war began, right up until today. And that set the stage for, I think, events of October the 7th. The key statistics that I think matter for October the 7th that shape the reality of Gaza on the eve of October the 7th were the following. 2.2 million people in Gaza, half of them children, 70% of them refugees, 97% of the water contaminated. The um, former British Prime Minister, now U.S. Secretary, uh, US, uh, UK Secretary, uh, Foreign Secretary David Cameron, described Gaza as an open air prison. <clears throat> and in 2006, an Israeli government advisor, Dove Wiseglass, was widely quote, quoted as saying that Israel's policy toward Gaza would be the following quote, the idea is to put the Palestinians on a diet, but not to make them die of hunger. And so what happened was Gaza became dependent on foreign aid. Um, <coughs> Israel would calculate the population and send in just enough foreign aid to make sure that there wasn't um, uh, starvation, but just enough for people for, to survive. And that was the condition of the people living there. There's also something to be said about the international and regional context of what was happening just before October the 7th. <clears throat> Prior to October the 7th, the reigning view in Washington, the West, Israel, and many Arab capitals was the Palestine question was over. Nobody cares about it. No one needs to worry about it. The Palestinians are too divided. <clears throat> Let's move forward and try and bring about reconciliation between Israelis and Arabs by signing what was called the Abraham Accords. <clears throat> this was Jared Kushner's idea. Um, Joe Biden jumped onto it when he came president. And it was a wonderful sort of plan, according to its theoreticians, that said, look, the Palestine question is too divisive. Let Arab states and Israel come together around shared security concerns, shared economic concerns, and we can simply forget about the Palestine. Now, that was a wonderful idea, 
The only problem was, for many people around the world, particularly in the Arab world, the Palestine question and their suffering still mattered. And I think one of the challenges, one of the problems why so people, many people are still shocked today about what's happened, <clears throat> is they were under the assumption that the Palestine question was over. And if you listen to what ben Netanyahu was saying when the Abraham Accords were uh, announced, he was sort of um, pointing his finger to his political opponents on the left in Israel and saying, see, we told you so. We didn't have to make land concessions. The formula of land for peace um, was a bogus one, as we always said in the Likud party. We don't have to give up any concessions. The Arab states came to us, and now we can have peace. And of course, the untold story of the Abraham Accords, it's there if you just look at it. This is not peace between Israel and the Arab world. This is peace between Israel and the dictators of the Arab world, who um, you know, are perhaps some of the most repressive regimes in the region. So um, let me get quick, because get, I want to I get to questions. Um, let's get quickly to some of the myths that I think this of tackle some of them, because it's important, and I really want you to push back on uh, what I have to say, um, because that's when we really get to learn, when there's some sort of back and forth in contestation of ideas. So one of the big questions or myths that you've heard about, you're all familiar with, is the following. What should Israel have done on October the 7th? Um, if the United States was attacked in a similar way, you can bet that they would have responded forcefully. Well, actually, we know what happened after 9-11, and the United States did respond forcefully in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we all know how that turned out. <clears throat> um, the idea, or the question, of what should Israel have done, I think, is uh, a question that is a legitimate one, but I think part of the answer to the question is that, well, Israel should not have been treating the Palestinians with such a dehumanizing set of policies that effectively marginalize them, dispossess them, oppress them. Um, had that not happened, then I think we would be having a different conversation today. Uh, so that has to be part of the equation if you want to take that question seriously. There's also a related question. When someone asks me, um, what would you do in the Israeli's place? I respond, what would you do in the place of the Palestinians? What would you do if you were Palestinian today? What options did you have? Um, I think there were other options that Palestinians did have, but I don't think you could understand this question of what should Israel have done, how should they have responded, um, simply by posing the question and not looking at both sides of this conflict. Interestingly, if you actually listen closely and read the words of Israeli leaders, they often say things that are quite interesting and revealing. Former Israeli foreign minister and former prime minister Ehud Barak was once asked, what would he do if he was a Palestinian? And he responded, quote, If I were a Palestinian of the right age, I too would join at some point one of the terrorist groups. The moral takeaway here is that you have to solve both equations simultaneously if you're serious about dealing with this conflict and this crisis. There's no other solution other than a solution that sort of anchors and connects Israeli security with Palestinian security. And this is one of the, I think, it's not controversial to think about it, but as I said a moment ago, everyone in the West, everyone sort of thought that that equation was part of the past. Now the question of Hamas is central to this story. There's a narrative that somehow if Hamas didn't exist, we wouldn't be having this conflict. But of course, if you know your history, um, Hamas was created right around 1988. Uh, the Israel-Palestine conflict far predated that. So how can we understand this dimension of the conflict? And one of the aspects of this conflict is that Hamas is ISIS. Um, and I want to draw upon the work, it's a really good essay if you want to read about this, in Time Magazine that my friend Monica Marks wrote. And she made the, the observation uh, that I think is worth sharing with you. That Israeli leaders frequently make the point that Hamas and ISIS are no different. But scholars of political Islam, as well as counter-terrorism officials, have long understood that this comparison is false. As Gershon Baskin, one of Israel's lead hostage negotiators, have said about Hamas in 2006, that its acts of terrorism resemble ISIS, but they don't have the same ideology. The first and foremost important difference is that Hamas is a Palestinian nationalist, Islamist movement. This fused dual identity differentiates it from ISIS. 
which is a transnational pan-Islamist movement that doesn't believe in borders and wants to create some sort of global Islamic state um, uh, on the map as we know it today. Hamas, on the other hand, has a more localized demand. It identifies the liberation of all of Palestine from what it terms the Zionist entity as its core goal, as stated in its 2017 updated charter. There's also the inconvenient fact that ISIS literally views Hamas as apostates because they have a close relationship with Shia Iran. A second key difference is their relative religious extremism. Hamas is religiously conservative, but it does not ruthlessly harass or kill non-Muslims in Gaza simply because they have a different religion. It sometimes tolerates plurality of um, lifestyles in terms of dress code, women who wear the hijab or don't wear the hijab critically, are not harassed in Hamas-controlled regions, kids who sport tattoos, teenagers who listen to American music generally go around without being harassed. Christians and churches also coexist with Muslim places of worship in the Hamas-run enclave of Gaza. Um, None of this would have been possible under ISIS, a far more religiously extremist organization that tortures and mutilated people and compelled them to adherence to their ultra-violent, radical version of Islam. A comparison between Hamas and ISIS um, um, can also be very politically useful. Insisting that Hamas is ISIS enables Israeli leaders to muffle criticism of their own treatment of the Palestinians, and they also help mobilize a public opinion here in the United States, because the argument is, is that if we don't defeat Hamas in Gaza, they're going to come after you in the West. And if you know anything about the Arab-Israeli wars, at least going back to 1973, most of them ended because of U.S. pressure. And in order to prevent that pressure on Israel, you play the game that there's no difference between ISIS and Hamas, um, and that's politically very convenient. Um, in terms of the background of Hamas, it's existed for decades. It grew out of a Muslim charity organization in the 1970s that were affiliated with the Egyptian Brotherhood movement. It has a large social service wing. It split from the secular nationalist PLO um, after the 1990 Oslo Accords were signed and the various failed peace processes get, got Palestinians to be very disillusioned about the political order. And some of them start to start, some of them started to sympathize with the Hamas alternative. As I mentioned earlier in 2006, there was elections in Palestine, in Gaza in particular, and along with its rival um, in the West Bank, Hamas did quite well. It was one of the two main political factions, and it won those elections, not in a majority, but they won a plurality of the vote. And Hamas has continuously, interestingly, negotiated with Israel on borders, prisoner swaps, and how to govern Gaza. It's also, to some extent, it's accurate to say that Hamas is the Frankenstein monster of Benjamin Netanyahu, whose policies empowered Hamas in an effort to divide and weaken the Palestinians um, in the West Bank and Gaza. And there's this very famous statement that he made in 2019 at the Likud party meeting, where he said, if you want to oppose the Palestinian state, support my policies in Gaza with respect to Hamas. That helps sort of keep Palestinians divided, it scares away global public opinion, it's the best way of advancing, you know, our political agenda. Hamas justifies its horrific acts of terror as resistance to Israel's occupation and has traditionally exploited the traumas suffered by Palestinians uh, to grow its ranks, to recruit new members, it attends funerals, it contacts bereaved families of, of people who have been killed in Israeli airstrikes, its militants also capitalize on the deprivation the isolation and the prison-like conditions that have prevailed in Gaza since Israel began its blockade roughly 17 years ago. The question of to what extent is Hamas a problem can also be asked in the context of the West Bank. If you look at the West Bank, <coughs> you'll see that Hamas is not in control there. <coughs> but over the last year, according to UN figures, 570, 507 Palestinians were killed in the West Bank, including 81 children. <coughs> and um, human rights groups that looked at what's happening in Israel-Palestine. In the year 2021, we had roughly four different human rights reports that characterized the situation in Israel-Palestine as one that approximates, not just approximates, but that is 
a manifestation of the international crime of apartheid. Um, that's what Amnesty International said, that's what Human Rights Watch said, that's what the UN said, that's what Israel's leading human rights organization, Bet Selim said, where in 2021 they published a report called From the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, a land of Jewish supremacy. This is apartheid. The question of Hamas and human shields is a frequent point that keeps coming up time and time again. And the question is, to what extent is there any valid basis for that claim? I'm deeply skeptical of it. Of it. In fact, if you actually look at uh, the Human Rights, uh, sorry, the Amnesty International report that was uh, devoted to this topic, they investigated it in the context of the 2008-2021 uh, conflict between Israel and Hamas, and they found no evidence. What's really going on, I think, with respect to this debate on human shields, is that if you have a sense of history, every occupying power invokes the argument of human shields when it's trying to crush an armed revolt to its rule. There's really nothing new here. Hamas did not invent a new tactic of warfare, as we're often told by some people in Washington and in Israel. Most guerrilla insurgencies, um, that are fighting a much stronger military power seek to deal with the asymmetry in power by using urban, urban guerrilla tactics where it draws on the support of a friendly population to achieve its military objectives. Recall, if you know your history, what the French did in Algeria when they tried to crush a movement for national independence or what the U.S. did in Vietnam. They invoked very similar arguments that we hear today about Hamas as human shields when they were fighting an armed resistance that lived among civilians and drew some support from that civilian population. These guerrilla tactics typically in, entail hiding with and among civilian population who have some sympathy to their nationalist and political objectives. More powerful states hate this fact <coughs> because it costs them a lot to crush resistance in civilian populated areas, so they blame their enemies for using human shields. There's a very famous line from the late Mao Zedong, the founder of the Chinese Revolution, who said that gorillas are like fish. They swim in the sea of the people that support them. And I think that's very much, I think, what's going on today. Now, time is quickly fleeting. Um, I just want to come to a conclusion because I want to uh, leave lots of times for questions and answers. Um, as you all know, or should know, the situation in Gaza is horrific. I was looking at some of the figures. Uh, one of the key aspects of the war in Gaza today is that this is very much a war against children. Um, more children, um, the UN and Human Rights Watch have said, have been killed in Gaza over the last four months than in all conflict between 1919, between 2019 and 2022. So if you look at the graph, the number of children killed worldwide between those years 2019 and 2022 is less than the number of children that have been killed over the last five months in the Gaza Strip. And this brings us back to, I think, why we're all here tonight. It brings us back to the coalition that has put this event together tonight. And as I've been thinking and reading and reflecting about this trauma and this tragedy that's unfolding in the Middle East, I often ask myself, what would I do if I was alive in a different time period, in a different um, moment in time when there was a great moral crisis unfolding around me? What would I do if I lived during slavery? Or what would I do if I were alive during the era of Jim Crow? Or what would I do if I lived during the era of apartheid in South Africa? What would I do if I came to know that my country was somehow complicit in gross human rights violations, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and a possible genocide? Well, I think the answer to those questions um, is I would do things very much like what the organizers of this event are doing here tonight. You attend lectures, you try to educate yourself, you talk to your neighbors, you talk to your family, you try to mobilize concerned citizens, you try passing resolutions in city and town councils, you try to keep this issue in the public domain, you try to demand accountability from our elected officials. And of course, 
None of this by itself will stop the horrors in Israel and Palestine. None of this by itself will stop the killing in Gaza. Nor will it produce immediately a just resolution of the Israel-Palestine conflict. But I do believe activities such as this um, that bring us here tonight are deeply significant and they're a critical step forward in the right direction in trying to resolve this crisis. Thank you. So we have time for questions and answers and there's a microphone here. And I'm, um, I'm going to just call people as I see their hands. Yeah, the woman at the back right there in red. And real quickly, uh, let's, if you have a question, why don't we form a line here? And, um, okay, form a line there and then we'll, we'll do it. But let's give the first question to the woman that I identified since her hand was the first I saw. And uh, try to keep your question within 30 seconds and I may cut you off. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, but what you're doing here is not balanced. You're having this war in Gaza because hostages were taken and people were, you know, mutilated, whatever, in Israel. And I think if you want to pressure the American government and the Western governments and the UN, fine, go out and rally and say, you know, we want a ceasefire. But say we want a ceasefire and bring the hostages back. Because if you bring the host if Hamas returns the hostages, then the war in Gaza will end. You can't have it one way. You need both sides. Is that a it, it can be a comment. It can be a comment. That's perfectly fine. That's a very legitimate comment. I'd like to respond to it. Um, when you say everything will be fine, if well, you could fine is the wrong way. Excuse me, but things will be better. Fighting yeah, to get the sorry. hostages well, back. See, the, the problem that I have with your question that I take as a very serious question is that there's an assumption that everything was fine on October the 6th. And they weren't fine for the 2.2 million Palestinians living in an open air prison. Living right, but you're talking with, about a ceasefire. You're asking for a ceasefire. Right. And the reason there isn't a ceasefire is because Hamas is not returning the hostages. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Those are two different things. Obviously, we all want the hostages to be released, right? But I'd also sort of you know, add to the uh, question here. This, is, this isn't often sort of stated. Uh, but the first point I would make is that, look, um, if you think that this crisis is a function of what happened on October the 7th, I tried to make an argument here that there's a deeper history. So that's, that's point number one. The second point is I completely agree. All hostages have to be released. That also means... Um, the thousands of Palestinians, many of them children, who have been arrested on the Israeli side on what's called administrative detention. Not that they've done anything wrong. Throwing a rock, even uh, raising a Palestinian flag can get you arrested, and you're not told of the charges and that can be renewed. I consider that a form of hostage taking. They have to be released as well. So Israel is willing, but Hamas is requesting that they return some of the... Um, some of the people who have, who have killed and, you know, bombed or whatever, and were suicide bombers. Yeah. Nobody talks the, about yeah, suicide yeah. bombers. But then we get into the case of, okay, well, how do we sort of equitably and fairly determine who has blood on their hands and who doesn't, who should be released and who doesn't. So I, my, my point or my response to you would be, um, this issue in this crisis is much greater than October the 7th. I agree. I agree. And the hostages that were taken never should have been taken. But at the same time, the occupation, the dispossession, the siege on Gaza, that shouldn't have lasted that long because that set the conditions for this particular moment. I agree with you. I'm just saying that if you're going to, you need to balance what you're requesting. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm curious as to whether you think, um, in terms of, you know, you, you started the presentation talking about equality, the yeah. equality for both sides. Do you think at this point in the future a two-state solution is equitable for both sides? Well, you know, if you actually look at the map, um, I think I have a map here because it's sometimes better to uh, look at this in terms of a map. Um, so if you actually look at this map here, um, the issue that's at stake here in terms of a two-state settlement is really the following division of territory. 
Um, 78% of what's called British mandated Palestine is considered under international law to be Israel's legitimate borders. We're talking about the remaining 22%. And on that 22%, there is a division and a debate between the Israelis and Palestinians. Israel wants to take some chunk of that 22%, particularly in the West Bank, and leave perhaps what's left over to a Palestinian state. Um, it's an open question whether that's a just settlement. Because I think what's at play here is, first of all, can a Palestinian state that's not contiguous um, be, survive? The other related question here is, what do you do about the fact that if you actually look at the map of uh, the West Bank and of those territories that Israel has occupied since 1967, right now there's about a million Israeli settlers that have moved into territory that Israel has occupied since 1967. A just settlement, a two-state settlement, would entail them all leaving or moving. Is that a realistic option? So, I used to be a big proponent of the two-state settlement because it sounds like it will be some sort of equal division of labor. But the more you look at the way West Bank settlement has really sort of increased you know, at a very high rate, uh, and you ask, your, ask yourself, is it, is, it, is it possible to roll that back? It opens up a big question mark as to whether a two-state settlement is a viable option right now. I think the best preferred option, from my perspective, is the one that I sort of mentioned in my talk and that you sort of alluded to in your question. I believe in equality. I don't believe in ethno-nationalist states. I don't believe in states where one particular ethnic group or religious group has more rights than the others. I believe in sort of the normative ideal of what we would call liberal democracy, where people can have their religious identities, they can affirm them publicly, but the laws of the land have to treat everyone uh, equally. So my ideal situation is to have some sort of binational state where both Israelis and Palestinians will be treated equal under the law, but they still be able to affirm their own national and religious identities. Now, how do we get from where we are today to that ideal is a big question. I think the best answer that I've heard is that we should stop talking about a two-state settlement or a one-state settlement. And as Americans, what we should be doing is asking our elected officials to simply enforce U.S. law with respect to the Israel-Palestine conflict. We should, in other words, stop um, giving Israel blank checks, supporting Israel unconditionally, and thinking that that's going to somehow create better conditions for a peace settlement. So let me just cite one example. U.S. law states that we should not be giving weapons to a country that is using them to commit war crimes. That's on the books. We should enforce that. Also, U.S. law says that we should not be giving aid to a country that blocks humanitarian aid. I think if we start doing those types of things, then I think the political and social conditions within Israel-Palestine perhaps will start to change in a better direction, but it's going to be a long-term situation. One of the problems that we have is on both sides. On the Israeli side, Netanyahu is not someone who I think is interested in peace or compromise. Neither is any member of his coalition. We have a problem. On the Palestinian side, you've got Hamas, and then you have a corrupt Palestine national authority. So I think one of the equations and key ingredients here that I think is a necessary um, ingredient for a just resolution is we have to get some sort of new Palestinian leadership. And it's not the type of new Palestinian leadership that we hear Washington talking about or the Arab states talking about. They want a Palestinian leadership that's basically compliant and it's a collaborating authority. I'm talking about a Palestinian leadership that's of the moral fiber and character of what we saw in South Africa under the African National Congress and Nelson Mandela. One that's accountable, representative, rooted in a human rights conception of justice, and is willing to actually do the type of things that can work with their adversary, and in the case of South Africa, the white community, uh, to bring about some sort of settlement. So I think this idea of two-state settlement, which we sort of hear, is really uh, rhetoric. It's rhetoric that's not really serious. Um, it sounds nice on paper, but as long as the United States continues to sort of um, um, give Israel unconditional support without establishing any sort of conditions for its support in terms of getting to a situation where you can have a two-state settlement, I think all that talk is just rhetoric and it's not going to get us anywhere. Thank you. Hi, thank you for coming. And um, you answered so many of the questions that I had and even submitted beforehand. But there were some more like practical questions that I had. Like, I um, was accused of anti-Semitism for just raising the question 
um, I've spoken over saying there's no apartheid, there's no secondary, second class citizens. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm somebody, I grew up in Aspen, but I went to an international boarding school in London, so I had Palestinian, Saudi friends I'm still in touch with. So I've had a wider purview um, to that since I was a, a girl, right? Um, but how, how do you take on that? First of all, you're an anti-Semite if you disagree. Um, and number two, um, you don't have a right to talk about this because you're not Jewish. Um, okay, those are good questions. Um, first of all, the, the idea that somehow if you criticize Israel, you're an anti-Semite is as ridiculous as saying that if you criticize the government of Iran or Saudi Arabia, you're an Islamophobe. Now, criticism of Israel can veer into anti-Semitism if you're not focusing your criticism on the policies of the state and the politicians. If you're making generalized statements about Jews, Jews do this and Jews do that, and they have some sort of character flaw, then you're in the, the, the area of anti-Semitism. And that has to be so. But most people, at least that I interact with, are not engaging in that anti-Semitic rhetoric. But there is an attempt, unfortunately, for supporters of Israel, particularly on the right, in Israel and in the United States, to weaponize charges of anti-Semitism to silence criticism. Just to give you one example, when South Africa brought Israel before the World Court in um, January, charging it with the crime of genocide, the Israeli spokesperson, Eugene Levy, responded to the South African uh, petition at the World Court by saying that what South Africa has done is equivalent to an ancient Jewish blood libel against Jews for asking Israel to live up to its obligations under the UN Genocide Convention. And the problem with that type of weaponization of anti-Semitism is it shifts attention in a way from a problem that we are seeing today of the very real rise in anti-Semitism in different parts of the world. And when you weaponize it in such a political way, simply to shield your favorite country from criticism, it actually shifts attention away from problems of anti-Semitism that we have in different parts of the world and in this country. So this is, I think, if you're going to get involved in the Israel-Palestine conflict, you have to figure out, and you have to be very careful, that people are going to try and silence you by saying that you're an anti-Semite. Shut up. You're, you're a racist and a bigot. And I think the way that you respond now is, number one, criticizing the policies of the state is not anti-Semitism. It's criticizing those policies of the, of the state and what they're doing. And in terms of you have no right to speak, I think the response that you should give is that, well, you know what? My government is giving Israel $4 billion a year. It's my tax dollars, and they're using it to drop on the people of Gaza. That's not how I want my money spent. I have every right to speak out on this issue. is regarding kind of a, an existing framework for national reconciliation after um, a genocide has taken place. You know, it strikes me that the kind of examples we have in the 20th century haven't been particularly successful. So, you know, Bosnia is split between these kind of smaller ethno states. Uh, Rwanda, you know, is essentially controlled by the leaders of the genocide. There's been no action in Burma. Um, you know, you mentioned in South Africa, so it, it, is that the kind of the framework for national reconciliation in Israel-Palestine? Yeah, that's a good point. A yeah. so it's a very good point. When you have violence of this level that is genocidal, near genocidal, then, you know, you can't just turn the page on that and think after the conflict is over, everyone goes home and the trauma just disappears. It's generational. And we can see that right now in terms of the World War II and the Holocaust, the generational trauma that has inflicted on American Jews, if you talk to any community that's been, I mean, I know a lot of Armenians, you know, what happened, they're traumatized still by that, and that's like over 100 years ago. Um, I think there can't be national reconciliation unless there is some semblance of justice. And that has to mean that those people, not populations, but I think the Nuremberg principles are worth remembering here. The West, when they tried the Nazi war criminals, they didn't go after the entire German population. They took the leadership of the Nazi party. They tried them, they put them on trial for crimes against humanity, for genocide. And um, that was a, an effort to sort of turn the page of history. That there was some adjudication, there was a trial, there was, you know, people were sent to jail. Um, I think that has to be part of any sort of solution. Uh, or else there won't be national reconciliation. I think that's exactly why things in Bosnia went so wrong. Is that you just the division of land, the same people who prosecuted, 
genocide, some of them fled, many of the same people are still around, and the trauma and the hurt is still there, and it's still you know, one millimeter before, below the surface, and it can reproduce itself. So I think the South Africa model is, I think, the one that I see as the most likely. Um, um, but of course, South Africa is somewhat of a unique case because it was a question of racism, right? Black and white. It was very easy you know, to see what a solution could be. But very much in the case of South Africa, they did produce something that I think is very important, and then I'd like to see in some, in some sort of just resolution of this conflict, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, the position that South Africans take is that, took, is that we don't want to go after people and be punitive. If those people who have blood on their hands, who have tortured people, if they're willing to come and apologize to their victims, to ask for forgiveness, and to do this in a public realm, then we will give them a lighter sentence, or sometimes we will even ignore their sentence, in the interest of national reconciliation. But only national reconciliation on the condition that you can have truth publicly on display for the public. So I think something like that is very much needed. How we're going to get there is an open question. Thank you. So you had mentioned in the beginning, in the beginning about the, uh, the framework, the human rights framework, and you had mentioned the Nuremberg trials, and mm -hmm. said, the Tokyo trials. But um, what kind of damage, you know, is being conducted, do you think, to the human rights framework? You know, the Geneva Conventions, the, you know, yeah. and, and, and can it, you, you, have, you have posed the question, can it survive? And that's kind of what... I mean, the problem here is that many of the people in the countries that were responsible for establishing the human rights framework, the United States, Europe, and the West, and now are now caught in this very awkward situation where they claim that we support the UN court, they support international law, they support all of these provisions. And when it comes to Ukraine and Russia's intervention and aggression in Ukraine, you hear these Churchillian speeches by Western political leaders invoking the sanctity of international law, the need to prosecute war crimes, the need to bring people like Putin before the International Criminal Court. But the exact same people, when it comes to Israel and Gaza in the Middle East, say the exact opposite. So when South Africa brought its case under international law to the World Court, the United States, Canada, and many European countries basically said, we don't recognize the case. We don't recognize the application. And so this is creating a lot of doubt in the minds of many people around the world, where the whole principle of human rights is predicated on the idea of universality. It's not about picking and choosing you know, when you're going to enforce human rights. It's about everyone being treated under the law equally. And when you have countries um, that are so brazenly hypocritical, and we see it today, I think one reason why I said that the international human rights framework is on the verge of being broken is because it's happening against the backdrop, and it's being juxtaposed with what's happening in Ukraine. And so people are watching this, and people aren't stupid, and they're saying, well, what the hell's going on here? Um, um, and so it's very difficult to take the United States and the West seriously now over uh, this glaring hypocrisy. I think we've lost the global south. We've lost a lot of young people in this country. Um, and it's really a question of whether that can be resuscitated again. Um, it's interesting to know, and this is, doesn't generate the amount of tension that it deserves, but we have some, something called the International Criminal Court, for which the United States is not a member. And the International Criminal Court's mandate is to try war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. And what does that say about American foreign policy? That it doesn't want to join that court because it fears prosecution. It's not a step in the right direction. Um, and so this is a big problem that we have. Um, and um, the way out of it is pretty clear. I think we have to have some consistency. We have to have some um, better political leaders that are willing to sort of rise uh, if you believe in international order, we hear a lot of talk about a rules-based order. A rules-based order. But it can't be a rules-based order when it's my side that I want to sort of have the rules applied to, but not the other side. There has to be some greater consistency, or else people are going to say this is just a bullshit arrangement that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. And of course, what this does is this is music to the ears of Putin. This is music to the ears of Xi Jinping in China. They're exploiting this moment for all that it's worth. And they're going to sort of use it to say, don't criticize our human rights record. Don't criticize what we're doing in Xinjiang or in Ukraine. Look what you're backing and financing in the Gaza Strip right now. Yeah, next question. First of all, thank you so much for being here. I'm a member of CSPAR Now RFE, and I talk about this a lot. 
obviously. So something I keep running into, and I'm hoping you can shed a little light on it. Mm -hmm. People are constantly telling me that there was no one there in Gaza when Israel came. It's, I've heard the like bullshit thing that they weren't good stewards of the land, so it's okay to kick them out, whatever. But I keep running into people saying that there was no one there. Where does that come from? Um. Someone who hasn't read a history book in his life. Is it that simple? Yeah. I'm just, what do I say to well, these well, people? Well, well, I think you have to see when you get getting it, when you get involved in this, you have to do your homework because being knowledgeable and being aware of the facts gives you uh, confidence to push back at ridiculous arguments such as this. So I would push back and say, do you actually know when Israel came and occupied the Gaza Strip? Do you have any sense of what 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 time that was, what year that was, and see if they can answer the question. If they don't say 1967, then they don't know what they're talking. about. But I think there is a, I think the argument might be a deeper one where they're saying that no, Palestine was an empty land that didn't exist and uh, Jewish nationalists known as Zionists came there and they made the desert blue. That Palestine, there was a very, very famous phrase, that Palestine was a land without a people for a people without a land. It was just empty and there was a lot of historical scholarship of a very weak nature that tried to justify this. That Palestine was simply an empty territory, and um, um, Israeli settlers, Jewish settlers came, created the state of Israel, and um, Palestinians sort of showed up afterwards because they wanted jobs. In fact, there was actually a famous book published in 1984 by this um, obscure writer, writer called John Peters, called From Time Immemorial, that effectively made that argument. Of course, it's a laughable argument because it has no um, historical validity. But I think the way that you respond to these issues is that you have to first and foremost know your own history, know your own facts, being able to cite them. And then when someone makes a, you know, a, an intellectually vacuous argument like, like the one that we're talking about, you can sort of respond back in a couple of sentences and hopefully that will be the end of it. It's also a classic colonialist trope to see no one in the land where you're about to That's a long-standing position. So yeah, you're right. And if you look at, in fact, if you look at some of the founding fathers of Western political thought, right, when you look at sort of, um, uh, what people like John Locke said, like John Locke wrote the Constitution for Carolina. When he was writing about, you know, the Constitution, this is the early American settlement, he was referencing uh, indigenous populations. We knew they were there, but the idea was that they were just like part of the landscape. They were the rocks. They weren't human beings who had um, equal moral value. And one of the problems that John Locke says is, well, we can't consider these people as human beings because they didn't have private property. They just roamed the land, there was no sense of sort of individual ownership, and so they were simply of a different cultural category that we didn't have to deal with. This is inbuilt into colonialism and the way we think about indigenous populations. Um, thankfully now, you know, there's been a revisiting of this, there's a greater sensitivity to these types of debates. These things would pass by without any criticism in a previous era. Now they generate more critical scrutiny, I think that's for the better. Hi, yeah, thank you for covering so much in a very short time. Um, my question, I'm curious if you could speak a little bit about the U.S.'s relationship with Israel and like the strength of that relationship and why the U.S. is such a steadfast ally to Israel? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, there's many reasons, I think, why the United States is an ally of Israel. One, there's a series of cultural reasons that exist in the United States that looks toward Israel as a part of the world, as a country, that is connected to our Judeo-Christian heritage. So a lot of people were deeply Christian, deeply religious. They view Israel as sort of a fulfillment of a certain interpretation of Christianity. There's that commitment. There's also, I think, the very deep and real commitment that Israel needed to be created and supported because of the history of anti-Semitism that existed in the West going back thousands of years, culminating in the horrors of the Nazi Holocaust, and that Jews deserve some justice. They finally have a homeland. We need to support them. Then there's the geostrategic, political, sort of national security reasons that I talked about. Israel is a Western state. It's allied. We support it. It protects our interests. It protects the interests of our allies in the region. We need to support Israel uh, for that reason. Um, um, the other reason why I think that's very important, it's not the only reason, um, is that Israel has a very sophisticated lobby here in the United States that can sort of mobilize opinion if you follow debates on lobbyists, it's a toss-up whether the NRA or the pro-Israel lobby is most effective. But they can sort of, you know, they can they can throw their weight around. And um, if you think about the character of Joe Biden, Joe Biden, I think, has been deeply and closely connected 
Israel in ways that really don't make any sense when you look at it. And I think largely it has to do with his own sense of his political career and his convictions, uh, going back to the time that he was a senator, and he made his first trip to Israel, and he has this story that he tells that he met with the Prime Minister at the time, Golda Meir, and how he was deeply transformed by that, and um, that I think largely explains uh, we also have the other uh, reason is Israel is, um, gets $4 billion a year and it buys a lot of our arms, buys a lot of our weapons. There's a lot of political and business interests that are, I think are at stake here that want to keep that relationship going. So when you put that all together, the cultural, the political, the geostrategic, um, the business interests, that's why um, Israel is supported. But I think that's beginning to change because under, under you know, my students now don't understand why Israel gets so much support, they don't like what's happening right now in Gaza, they don't like what Netanyahu is doing, uh, and Joe Biden now, as you know, has a big problem in terms of his re-election this year because a lot of young people aren't going to vote because of what they're seeing in Gaza and what they hear coming out of the um, president's mouth. And I think the news today that was mentioned by Chuck Schumer, my reading of it, and I'm not being cynical, I think I'm being very accurate, I don't think that ha this, this has anything to do with a moral critique of Benjamin Netanyahu. The Democratic Party knows what the polls are. They see where things are headed. They're going to try and distinguish themselves and say, look, we're tired of what Israel is doing in Gaza. We actually do care about what's happening. Um, we're not as one-sided as uh, many people think we are. We're, we're going to throw Netanyahu under the bus and call for you know, some sort of balanced position. I think that's really what's motivating Chuck Schumer. Um, I wouldn't think it's anything more than that. Hey, just wanted to thank you for being here. Um, it means a lot. Um, so towards the end of your talk, you mentioned um, something about Netanyahu's government sort of propping up Hamas, and I was just wondering if you could uh, elaborate on that yeah. a little bit. So um, one of the classic stat strategies of control and occupation is this phrase that you heard before, divide and conquer. So I think what Netanyahu was doing um, was a classic case of sort of, you know, um, um, colonial sort of occupation strategy. You divide the Palestinians between two different groups, one's in the West Bank, one's in Gaza. You prevent them from be being united as a national movement. And you sort of um, keep Hamas around because they at least manage the population there, where they, so you don't have, they're at least the municipal authority. You allow foreign aid to come in, but just keep things at a low level. And you prevent any discussion of a political settlement. And in fact, Netanyahu has this famous statement that was widely reported roughly in October, October, November, where he famously said at the Likud party meeting that if you want to prevent, he was telling his own supporters, if you want to prevent a Palestinian state, you got to support my policies in Gaza, which means keeping Hamas there, but keeping them tightly controlled, um, we'll let enough aid in. If they ever get too big for their britches and they start firing rockets, we'll clobber them like we did in 2008, 2012, 20, you know, 2021. Uh, that's a good arrangement for us. And he was saying, look, we've got things under control in the Arab world now. All of these dictators are coming to make peace agreements. Let's just move forward. We don't have to deal with Palestinian self-determination. We don't have to give up any land. This was a good calculation, I think, that he made. But, of course, all of that blew up in his face on October the 7th. And I think one of the problems now why this war is continuing is that Netanyahu knows that if ever this war comes to an end, there's going to be a day of reckoning for him. He was, he was Mr. Security, right? And so he has every incentive to keep this war going. And that's actually one of the things that Chuck Schumer said today in his comments, that Netanyahu has used his own political career to perpetuate these policies. Um, there's another related point to this that sometimes you hear, um, that Hamas was created or supported by Israel when it first emerged, in 1988, and there's an element of truth to that, um, and, and, and the story can simply be understood. Hamas was a minority religious current when it emerged. The dominant ideological current was secular nationalism. Israel was very happy to see a rival political current come and challenge the dominance of the existing secular nationalist Palestine national movement. It sort of didn't crack down on the early manifestations of Hamas, like to see Palestinian factions fighting, hoping that it could control the overall situation. But then this Frankenstein emerged as a result, and things got out of control. So that's, I think, the background. Thank you. Thank you again for being here. Um, I'm a fairly new resident of the Valley. Before I moved here in December, I was actually living in New York City when October 7th occurred. So I was privy to a lot of the massive protests that have emerged. 
um, relating to the ceasefire um, and this conflict. Um, I think what's so interesting about that to me um, is there has been such a mobilization of people in large cities, in small cities, in rural areas, and urban areas. And while there's such mobilization, there has been such a wall in the federal government system. I mean, we all saw the only Palestinian American get censured in November, which is essentially one step above getting expelled from Congress. So, as a political campaign manager, I'm a bit of a cynic as well, and we all saw Schumer's move as a very politically savvy move. So I guess, asking you, how does the will of the people in this country get actually well represented? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, it's a great question, because I wanted to actually speak to that question, so thanks for prompting me to respond to it. Um, one of the problems that we have in this country with respect to our democracy, that's quickly decaying and declining, is that U.S. foreign policy is probably the least democratic aspect of our political system. Political choices and what people in the White House do rarely reflects public opinion. U.S. foreign policy, particularly in the Middle East, is shaped by domestic lobby groups, not just the pro-Israel groups, but pro-Arab um, pro state lobbyists, the defense industry, Christian evangelicals, those are the people that shape policy. You and I have very little to say. And this speaks to the deeper problem of our broken democracy here in the United States. As I look at what's happening in this country, we have this reality where if you look at the data, you can win an election if you throw enough money at it. That's a problem not just in terms of you know, different policy issues, but also foreign policy. <clears throat> and so unless we can deal with that problem, we won't be able to deal with these other policy issues that matter and that are shaped by lobbyists, nor will we be able to deal with foreign policy issues that are also shaped by lobbyists. So in many ways, we're facing a big problem here in the United States, but we have a lot of foreign policy problems, but we have a much greater <coughs> crisis of democracy. So without some sort of significant campaign finance reform, where the level field can be equal, <coughs> You can actually predict election outcomes in this country by seeing how much money is in spent. Is that a democracy? No. Not the one I want to live in. That has to change. And of course the problem is, if you know this story, is the Supreme Court ruling in 2010, Citizens United. So now we have an even bigger problem, because the laws of the land don't prevent us from... So, but I think this is the number one... I, this, for me, it's the, well, it has to be one of the number one issues in our country. We have to take the private money and the influence over our political system out of it make it more equal, and if we don't do that, we won't be able to solve our foreign policy problems or our domestic ones. Thank you so much, Professor, for coming. Um, I have a two-part question about what we can learn from South Africa. Um, but first, I just wanted to mention uh, Rwanda as a model for truth and reconciliation. <coughs> Great question earlier. Um, it, it's amazing if you, when you visit Rwanda, people actually get along. People who were one time killing each other are now business partners and family members. It's a pretty amazing thing. You can go and visit places where uh, displaced people um, are, are actually rebuilding a life. So it is possible, and I want to keep that in my heart and in mind. So as far as South Africa, I um, uh, would love to hear a little bit more information about what you think as far as the ICJ and ICC cases that are being brought since you mentioned them. Um, but really, I would love to hear about BDS, because that is the other thing we saw, that that actually worked in South Africa. That worked to end apartheid. And I think Israel knows how powerful <coughs> BDS is. So could you please define what that is for people? And what is BDS up against in terms of anti-BDS legislation and ADL <coughs> sort of predatory uh, strategy against it. Yeah, BDS stands for Boycott um, um, Divestment Sanctions. It's very much um, an attempt by people who support a just resolution of the Israel-Palestine conflict and justice for the Palestinians to do what was done to South Africa in terms of boycott, divestment, and sanctions to the state of Israel until its policies change. That's the basic paradigm, that's the plan. 
and we have saw movements like this around the world. We saw a lot of opposition like this happen. I think Israel knows that this is a very dangerous development, so it's sort of used its supporters and its influence in this country to pass legislations at various state levels, various governments, that anyone who supports BDS you know, cannot be recognized. We have situations where you know, if you're a lecturer and you want to give a talk, let's say in Arkansas, and you're not willing to sign a petition that you oppose BDS, you can't speak in that state, you can't get an honorarium. That's how bad things are. And I think that's a reflection that Israel is very concerned about this. So I think, broadly speaking, Could you repeat that? That was, that was yeah. So we have legislation. I think many states. I don't have. I don't have the exact number. Thirty-two. Many states, Thirty-two states have passed legislation, laws in their state, uh -huh. that if you support boycotting, divestment, or sanctions on Israel, you can't come and do business in that state. Yeah. Cannot. You are an enemy, effectively. Um, and of course, this is not a reflection of the will of the people of that state. I think just a correct. A, question of effective lobbying, you know? APAC-sponsored bills. APAC-sponsored bills and sort of a very sophisticated political campaign. So, um, um, now I think at the end of the day, if you go to court, the courts won't uphold, uphold that particular law because it's fundamentally a violation of the First Amendment and right to assembly and organization. Do you want to say something? Yeah, as happened with uh, the good woman in, in Texas who was the speech pathologist for kindergartners for seven years. and. Um, after all the teachers had signed their contract for the year, they got a notice that, oh, everybody's got to re-sign your contract to work for the school district this year because there's been an amendment to it, which was an anti-BDS oath of loyalty to Israel. And she refused to sign it, was fired, and essentially won her case um, because they went behind closed doors and said, okay, we'll change the law to allow that. So this is a basically a movement It exists. I'm generally sympathetic to it. I do have a little bit of um, reservations about BDS in the following sense. I deeply believe that a complete and comprehensive boycott of everything Israel can be counterproductive in the following way. I think there's a lot of very genuine and decent people in Israel involved in human rights work, involved in reporting, involved in sort of what's happening, that I don't want to boycott. The other element is, is the following story that I'll tell you. I, I taught at the University of Denver for 15 years, and we used to have an exchange program where students would go over to Hebrew University and spend some time there taking courses and working in NGOs. Almost every student that went over to Israel for that program came back deeply politicized, deeply angry, because they saw what was happening with their own eyes. I think there's something to be said about you know, reading something in the paper or online, and then going there and seeing it yourself. A comprehensive, I think, BDS movement that prevents that, I think, would not be the best strategy. But, you know, all strategies are not perfect. There's always exceptions to the rule. So I strongly encourage my students, if they get a chance, to go there and see what's happening, because um, my experience is that my students come back and they're really angry and upset, and then when they find out what the United States is doing uh, in this context, they get even more upset. So those are my views. Uh, we are, everyone's more than welcome to stay as long as um, Professor Hashmi can stay standing. Um, <laughs> but as people trickle out, I again want to encourage everyone to um, donate to Doctors Without Borders tonight before, before we leave. Um, and follow us on Substack and Instagram and come with us to uh, the Carbondale Town Trustee Meeting Tuesday, March 26th. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, one, one question that I have is that uh, one thing we hear a lot is that the Palestinians all support Hamas, so therefore the Palestinians are Hamas, and we've got to wipe out Hamas, which means wipe out the Palestinians. And I recently read a poll by James Zogby that was taken on October 23, 2024, and it, 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 the polling was that only 11% of Palestinians in Gaza support Hamas. So could you talk about this, I guess it's a meme, where the, hey, all the Palestinians are about Hamas, so they're all bad. Um, that, that argument has been used to justify what we've been seeing over the last five months, that there's no distinction between Hamas and the population, so we have to get rid of all of them or punish them severely. Objectively speaking, as you just said, the polling doesn't back that up. 
I think the reason why Hamas had support in 2006 is that you know one of the realities of politics is that people make choices based on the options available to them. In the 2006 election, the two choices that people had was an old, established, corrupt ruling authority, one was the Palestine Authority, that was you know non-representative and brutal and um, you know, corrupt, and then you had this. Hamas that plat campaign on a platform of anti-corruption. They were never in power. So people said, well, who do we vote for? Some people voted for Hamas, but they weren't the majority at the time. Nowadays, I think Hamas's popularity, I mean, it's tough to measure it because you have a war going on, right? So I suspect that <coughs> Hamas's popularity has taken a big hit in some sections of Gaza because of this war that's happened. People are asking, well, we didn't ask for this, we didn't want this, we were never consulted. So I would ask the same question in reverse. Do all Israelis support Benjamin Netanyahu? Well, some of them do, some of them don't. Um, like all political systems, there's a spectrum. Uh, all Americans don't support Donald Trump. Um, uh, Palestinian politics is no different. You have a spectrum. Some people support different political factions, and that's often a function of the social conditions, political conditions, economic conditions at the time when you're asking the question. I hope that... Hi, thanks for your time and knowledge. Um, what I'm kind of hearing today is that a strong goal for progress would be to divert foreign aid to Israel, hopefully attainable goal. Um, in your opinion, do you, or do you have a strong opinion on if that were to happen, what would be a productive way to use that money instead? I think it's I think it's less a question of diverting aid. It's less it's more of a question of holding Israel accountable for the aid that it gets, and that means simply enforcing U.S. law. We U.S. law says we should not be arming or sending weapons to a country that is engaged in war crimes and human rights violations. Enforce that law. I think we should also be using U.S. influence in the aid that we have over Israel, which is not just economic, but it's also political. We frequently cast vetoes at the U.N. Security Council to defend Israel. I think if those policies were to change. Then I, think, then I think Israelis and Israeli leaders will start to have to recalculate that we always can't count on unconditional U.S. support for what we're doing. Maybe there's going to be a cost now. Maybe we're going to have to make compromises. Maybe we're going to have to rethink the way. I think one of the reasons why Israeli politics, there's many reasons, but one of the reasons why Israeli politics have shifted so dramatically to the right is because Israel knows that whatever it does, there will be no consequences from its greatest ally. And that just is a... Um, a replication of what's called spoiled child syndrome. If you're raising a child, you all, never discipline it, you give it whatever it wants, well, you know what the outcome is going to be. We're seeing that in the case of Israel. Um, the other related point here is that in the 2020 presidential election, I remember distinctly um, uh, Joe ba um, Bernie Sanders saying that if he gets pre elected president, one of the things that he wants to do is establish conditionality on aid to Israel for a serious peace process, for Israel being seriously committed in making compromises um, toward peace with, with, it, with the Palestinians. And when Joe Biden was asked that same question, and he was asked, well, this is what Bernie Sanders just said, what do you think about attaching conditions for American support to Israel for compliance and a commitment to a peace process? Joe Biden said at the time, he was baffled by the idea, it doesn't make any sense to him, it was completely ridiculous. It wasn't even an option. That's a problem, I think. That has to change. Um, and that's why I very much think that, you know, we don't have influence, direct influence over that. I mean, we don't have a lot, of, we can't make decisions for other peoples who are in a conflict. But we can be responsible for what we are doing with our political support and our economic support. And we can establish conditionalities and conditions on that support in order to have the outcomes that are in keeping with our values. And I think if we start moving in that direction, then things are going to change, hopefully, in Israel that would make it much more, that would incentivize them to realize that it can't be the same year after year, moving in this direction, ignoring the Palestinians, thinking that we can carry on like this forever. We've seen that that's unsustainable. So that this is actually, I, I would argue, you can make an argument that, that um, giving Israel some tough love is actually good for Israel's own long-term security interests. <coughs> But you're not going to do that unless you have politicians in Washington that are willing to you know, stand up and take a stand. I think what we're seeing from Chuck Schumer now 
as I said a moment ago, is really public pressure. Protests everywhere. I was very actually happy to read the other day that Joe Biden now is not giving public talks in big places, particularly in universities. His aides are making sure that all public uh, events that he has for the election are carefully choreographed to prevent people who are undesirable from coming into the event. Because what we're seeing time after time is that every time Joe Biden or Kamala Harris gives a public talk, someone stands up and says, what about Gaza? What about, and this is an embarrassment for the president. And so the fact that he's scared of actually talking to citizens because of his policy in Israel is the type of public pressure that we need to hold our account, our, 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 our elected officials accountable. <clears throat> Hi, I'd like to uh, have you clarify a couple points, two points actually. So you mentioned in the beginning that there is no ancient hatred between Muslims and Jews. Can you kind of explain that a little? Sure. Um, uh, that's what many people believe, but when I teach um, Middle East politics and Middle East history to my students, I often cite the example of um, modern-day Iraq and the city of Baghdad. A lot of people don't know this, but right up until the late 1940s, which, you know, is not, not that long time ago, but throughout the end of the 19th century, into the, in the 20th century, right up until roughly the year 1950, the capital of the, one of the major cities in the Arab world had a population that was one-third Jewish. These were not Jews living in a ghetto. They were very much part of the cultural, economic life of a new Iraq. They lived they cohabited. They were there for thousands of years. They were indigenous to Iraq. Why did they leave? Why did it all come apart? Well, because of the clash between Jewish national and Arab nationalism post-World War II when the State of Israel was created. Arab-Jewish relations took a deep hit. Many Iraqi Jews fled. But if you look at the history of the Ottoman Empire, when Jews were being persecuted in Europe during the Inquisition, during the rise of anti-Semitism, many of them fled to the Ottoman Empire which is a Muslim, Muslim empire. And they lived there, and they cohabited. So this idea that, you know, they've always been at each other's throats might sound intellectually and emotionally satisfying because it's an easy way to think about why these people are, you know, in conflict. But it doesn't stand up to historical scrutiny. There's the other example that, you know, if you, think, if you know anything about the period of, um, it's called in Arabic Al-Andalus, or in English, Islamic Spain. Muslims were in Spain roughly from the 8th century to the 14th century. And that was, during one period of time, that was the period when there was great religious tolerance, education, intellectual exchange, where Muslims, Jews, and Christians actually cohabited in ancient cities like Granada, Seville, Cordoba, and built one of the great sort of examples of inter-civilizational cooperation. If you read the history of that time, there's actually a wonderful book that I recommend called Ornament of the World by Maria Rosa Menical. Um, what was interesting about that period of time in Spain is that people from England and other parts of Europe would come to Spain and they would see these cities where people were living and thriving and they had sort of, you know, running water and they had sort of an urban sort of, you know, for that period of time, a modern city. And they were trying to figure out how did these Muslims do this when they were all living in sort of a very inferior, backward sort of state of state of affairs in comparison to the Muslims and Jews of Spain. Um, so there's, there's all these historical examples that one can point to that I think um, um, push back against that idea that they're always been, they've always been fighting. There was another point you had? Yes. Uh, so the question of whether Hamas is using human shields. Yeah. Um, I get this all the time. Uh, they're, you know, they're hiding in the tunnels under the cities, and that's why people are being killed. Um, but why don't we hear more about the fact that Gaza is basically like New York City? It's a big urban area, and there are no army bases. Um, Hamas doesn't have army bases from which to, to conduct a war. Um, they have no choice but to conduct that war from within their cities in, in the whole. But we never hear about that. We just hear yeah. they're hiding in the tunnels and that's think, why civilians are being I killed. think we don't hear about that because very much we are on the side of Israel in this equation, right? So we want um, Israel to prevail in its war objectives. We view that um, what Hamas has done 
you know, is the root of the problem, and that's all we need to know. And so, as you said, you, you, what you just said echoed what I was saying, that every um, occupying power, stronger military power, fighting a guerrilla, guerrilla insurgency makes the same argument. These people are hiding behind civilians. Why don't they come out and sort of face us? Of course, the reason why they don't come out, because they're going to be slaughtered, right? This is the strategy of guerrilla warfare, right? Why would you come out and say, here I am? It doesn't make any sense. So, if you examine the whole claim of human shields in the context of a comparative study of guerrilla insurgency in other parts of the world, you'll see that what Hamas is doing is not unique to the whole strategy of guerrilla insurgency. So this is what people do all the time that are fighting asymmetrical warfare and they're trying to sort of prevail in their military objectives. So there's nothing really new here. It's only new in the context of a very sort of one-sided interpretation of this conflict where they try to, in many ways, use the argument of human shields as a justification for what Israel is doing. If only Hamas didn't do this, we wouldn't be seeing this type of mayhem and chaos. But I think if you look at it from a different perspective, from the perspective of guerrilla insurgency in Vietnam and Algeria, and many other cases around the world, you'll see what's happening here is not really that different. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Oops. American treaty policy at the very beginning of our country, as you're aware, that we sign a lot of treaties, but we don't confirm them in our Congress much because of our need to control our economic interests, I think, more than uh, the fear of being uh, accused of genocide in an international court. That's kind of a more modern universal law mm -hmm. aspect of. Uh, treaty formation and uh, development, and that was just my one comment. Um, I'm trying to reconcile this whole thing. You know, I grew up in, a, in the generation of a father in World War II, friends in the Korean War, uh, friends who died in Vietnam, um, on and on, and uh, here we are again. Uh, we've got uh, Ukraine and, uh, uh, happening, and uh, a lot of people are kind of like, not pressing Congress to fund, fund that as much as we need to, yet we're here to try to divest uh, monies from Israel because of egregious uh, actions that they're taking in a war. Um, and I'm familiar with many people in Israel and they'll reflect on the uh, 2006 election of Hamas as being a total rigged election anyway. Uh, pop, the norm, average Palestinian doesn't have much to say because of the absolute failure of a political infrastructure there. So anybody with a little, with a gun and, a, and uh, some power can uh, become elected. And then you hear things of Arafat uh, over the years, uh, getting 95% of what he wanted and then refusing to sign that treaty. And then you, they also say, you know, there's people in Israel that I'm, I know that Hamas has repeated over and over again that their whole goal is to kill every Jew. So, with all of this, your comment about a, a crack, maybe a one state, let's vote like a democracy and see where the, the coins fall, or uh, versus a two state solution. I'm just trying to reconcile the, all of this. So, uh, would you please comment on that? Well, there's a lot that you said there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> look, I think, I think uh, let me just take one part of it. Um, the root of this conflict, I think, is a contestation over a small piece of territory between different, two different groups. And there's no way of solving this conflict when one side has a state, has an economy, has an army, has a future, while the other side is living under occupation, destitution, Disposition. That's a recipe for, I think, future conflict. Unfortunately, the calculation by the United States and Israel was that that actually was a sustainable option. We're seeing that it's not. So the challenge is, is how do we get to a situation where both Israelis and Palestinians have um, equal security, safety, and, and stability? Uh, the problem is, is that Israel has a lot of powerful supporters in the United States and the West. The Palestinians have literally no supporters. The Arab states that used to support them in my view, 
um, are all dictatorships, all monumentally corrupt. They actually don't like the Palestinians because the Palestinian cause and suffering stirs up popular mobilization in their own societies. And if you sort of follow what's happening right now, the Arab states you know, want this topic to go away because it's, it's generating discontent in their own countries. Uh, so they're part of the problem. So the Palestinians, not only do they have no international support, they have no great powers, they have no regional powers. I mean, Iran gives them some money. Uh, but the, critically, I think the problem here is that the Palestinians don't have their own effective national leadership. Hamas is not credible. Fatah is not credible, the PLO. This is one of the big challenges. In fact, just to share a bit of what I've been doing, I've been trying at this moment since October the 7th to talk to all of my Palestinian friends and intellectuals and people who are part of the Palestine national movement to say, look, now is the time to turn the page on history. What the Palestinians desperately need, in my view, is a credible leadership on the, on the, on the, on the scale and on the sort of um, designed on something that we saw in South Africa under the ANC, under Mandela, under the African National Congress. That type of leadership that's sophisticated, principled, you know, representative and able to sort of engage in the type of sort of, you know, international mobilization of solidarity that can end the conflict. Um, but again, we can't solve everything. Let me just end on this point. We can't do everything that's needed to get done to solve what's happening in Gaza and Israel right now. What we can do, what we should do, what we must do as American citizens is making sure that our money, our support, our political positions are not going to make a situation much worse. One of the realities that have not been, I think, adequately addressed in the context of the last five months is that all of those bombs that have been dropped on Gaza, the equivalent of three kilotons of bombs, three Nagasaki, three Hiroshima-like bombs, made in America made in this country almost exclusively. As an American citizen, I'm disgusted by that. I want that to end. If tomorrow Joe Biden were to tell Netanyahu, no more arms are coming, the conflict would end very quickly. In fact, Israeli uh, uh, generals have said that. If the, if, the, if the arms just stopped flowing, we would have a very different conflict. Um, so I think what needs to get done is we as Americans simply have to see what is it that we control what is it that we want? How much leverage do we have? Let's focus on that. We don't have control over what Israel is going to do in the end. We don't have control over what the Palestinians are going to do. But we do have control over our policies and the predictable consequences that flow from those policies. I think that's where the conversation should be in this country. Thank you. Thank you so much to you for being here and to everyone else who has saved the song and for showing up. I think it's amazing to see this within our community. But just a quick question. Um, you know, I, I, I studied history. I feel confident in my knowledge of this conflict. But when October 7th happened, I think something that was difficult to reconcile was the emotional politics behind this and as we heard earlier, you know, there's this this centering around the hostages and a lot of the narrative for people who are in support of of Israel. I've read, you know, Netanyahu himself saying that this war won't end until Hamas is it's not about the hostages, essentially. You know, a lot of Israelis, Israeli families of those hostages are unhappy with Netanyahu's actions. So my question to you, and I think part of the root of a lot of the questions asked tonight in terms of our confusion with what's going on is we can be confident in the facts, but how do you navigate that emotional tension? Um, you have to acknowledge the emotions, but then I think you have to get back to core principles in terms of how do we understand this conflict, how do we get out of it. The problem with what the U.S. is doing, what Israel is doing, is that they think, mistakenly, that there's a military solution to a political problem. Let's say Israel is able to crush Hamas and eradicate it. Is that going to solve the problem? There is going to be some other iteration of some form of national resistance organization, either in religious or secular form, that's going to say, look, we don't want to live as second-class citizens forever under occupation. So it's going to reappear again. And all of these dead people... They have relatives. They're seeing what's happening. They're going to be politicized. They're going to be very angry. And this cycle is going to continue. 
So the problem with, I think, the strategy and the policy that we're hearing from Western governments, particularly this government, is that they think that there's a, uh, if we can only crush Hamas, then everything will be solved. Well, guess what? This war, this conflict began way before anyone ever heard of Hamas, right? Mm -hmm. It goes back at least till 1948, most accurately after World War I. So, you know, yes, Hamas has really complicated things. It would be great if they didn't exist and there was another group in its place. Um, but I don't think simply focusing exclusively on Hamas without looking at the underlying social political conditions that gave rise to Hamas. I think Hamas is very much a symptom of the problem. It's not the root of the problem. And the problem fundamentally is a political problem, and that can't be solved through counterterrorism measures and through military means by destroying, you know, what's left of Gaza. That's simply going to perpetuate the problem. So this is, I think, the type of arguments that we have to sort of push back on, how we have to frame things. Um, and, you know, we can't leave it to our politicians to do that. It's going to need educated citizens who know what's going on, who can sort of ask the tough questions and hold people accountable. Unless that happens, I don't see any hope for a change in U.S. policy.